Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns podcast. I'm Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation, and I'm here to welcome Arthur Bevelis on the podcast. He's going to be sharing with us some very valuable insights regarding how family offices are investing today and what's going to happen in the future. Arthur is the leader of the Bevelis Group and the Family Office Insights, as well as several other organizations. I really would like to have Arthur tell us a little bit more about his background and the, and his journey. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Rosemary, and hello, everybody. So am I a dragon, a gazelle, or a unicorn? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the first time somebody asked you that. Um, fortunately for me, uh, I was toiling away 23 years ago, and uh, uh, even though I'm not a technologist, I built a technology company with a partner that did billing collection claims adjudication for a healthcare company. And we, I like to joke and say that we invented SaaS, software as a service, but it was really servers and disparate buildings put together with duct tape and gobble gu bubble gum, and it actually worked. And so um, the uh, fortunate part about it is they sold the company uh, once bought it back and then sold it again um, as a result of uh, a change of control from my primary customer and the primary investor at the time. So as legend has it, we were able to um, uh, sell it and get into a big fight with the Goliath and uh, essentially had contracts that allowed us to um, have this business that if there was a change of control that they either had to pay us the net present value of the future revenue stream, or they had to buy us out or keep us. And they decided they weren't gonna do any of those. So we had a big legal fight. And uh, at the end of the day, we had uh, a monetization event, which was not very elegant, but ended up being a meaningful amount of money where then I had to decide how to invest the money because I wasn't an investor at the time. Not sure that I am now, but I certainly didn't know anything about it then. So that's the genesis of me being a, uh, what you could argue is a private investor for the last 23 years. Oh, do I still have you? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, and so uh, along the way, I brought up three children and um, uh, lived in Villanova at the time, moved to New York City and formed my family office 13 years ago. And this, one of the operating companies that I own is what people uh, know most, and that's Family Office Insights, which is 22,000 members, 5,000 family offices, and it's just a group of active deal flow family offices, not a conference company, but even though we've done a conference at the UN, as you know. So that's it. I'm, I've got a community of active family offices, most of which aren't my peers because they're a lot richer than I am, and so we have a a group that is interested in, in seeking deal flow that's meaningful. And so we provide that platform without any, any success fee. And I'm just clearing that up from a regulatory perspective. We just provide a, a community where they, of peers where they can look at deal flow in a safe environment. And then along the way, I've invested uh, my own money in a variety of things, lost a bunch of money, made a bunch of money. And so uh, you know, fast forward to today, Family Office Insights act as, as a, uh, a nice platform for me to look at deal flow and many other family offices. Well, I have a, a thousand questions <laughs> about buying, selling a company, selling your own company, and then buying the company back. It's almost like getting married to the same person <laughs> twice. Which generally is not a good idea. No, so. yeah. Right. So I have a ton of questions about that. And I can, um, I can also go over a dragon, a gazelle, and a unicorn. Because a, 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 dra a dragon is, a, is an organization that has a $5 billion valuation within three years. And a unicorn has a billion dollar valuation. So dragons are extremely rare. Unicorns are, are rare. And then gazelles are uh, organizations that grow. They double their size every three years. Sounds like you had, it sounds like you had a combination unicorn gazelle as your company? Well, I, I, I don't want to attach any numbers to that, but it was meaningful. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, good. <laughs> so what do you call where you lose twice as much money in one year? Because I had one of those, right? Oh, oh man. Well, I don't, I don't think I have a name for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but um, I, so I, I have, the burning question is, so what are the family offices doing with this environment? You know, given the coronavirus, given the riots, given 
Black Lives Matter movement, you know, where is the, what's the feeling out there with family offices? So f at the onset of the coronavirus, um, I'd like to say I coined this phrase, but I didn't. Uh, family offices are in the privileged position of being firmly planted in midair anytime they want. In other words, unlike an institutional investor, there's no compelling reason for them to deploy capital because they don't have a job where they're hired for, uh, for example, for a pension fund and there's money coming in and they have to deploy it. So mm -hmm. uh, I would say at the beginning of the coronavirus, people were like, wow, this is again, something that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. We really don't know what's going on. And I'm not saying we do now uh, or they do now, but there's been a, a, a level of activity and this is not, this uh, may be interpreted as nefarious, but uh, many family offices are uh, distressed investors in the domain that they're familiar with. So what I mean by that is that many of the investments that would other be made, otherwise be made uh, sans coronavirus would be done at market rates, but there's discounts all over the place and there are, are large companies and small companies that uh, three months of not knowing where the cash flow is going to come, if you're standing there with a bucket of money, gives you an, uh, leverage to buy things at a discount. So there's a lot of activity. Mm. Just as a, as a data point in Family Office Insights alone, which is a very small data point, we normally got 200 applicants a month to wow. pitch to family offices and we only picked 15 or 20. Now we're over 250 a month. Wow. And uh, as you know, the pitches were done in person, which we're not doing anymore. And we're doing two to three to four webinars a week where, uh, and of course we still can only select uh, 15 or 20 companies a month, but it's interesting to see the uh, level of activity uh, to increase from the deal flow perspective. And anecdotally, we see a market increase in the amount of uh capital being deployed, even though we don't know uh, empirically all the time of, of how much money is deployed, at least in our little ecosystem. Outside of that, we have a better idea. Um, there's some optimism um, mm. that is uh, not uh, true across everybody. I mean, there's 5,000 family offices. We don't know what they're all doing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a, there's a uh, sentiment of optimism that this will all shake itself out. We don't know how long it's going to take and uh, things will be different, um, especially in uh, places where people convene, mm -hmm. whether it's schools or con uh, uh, cruise ships or restaurants or, and of course, idiosyncratically, we have issues in New York that are different than everywhere else. I, I mentioned to Rosemary, everybody who's on the podcast that I'm in Florida right now, I wasn't bailing from New York. I just needed some vitamin D mm -hmm. and Florida is as if coronavirus is not here. Wow. In contrast to New York where we're all wow. staying inside and not having cocktails with our friends and pe people are going out to dinner here and not a few are you wearing masks and it's, it's kind of bizarre. Wow. So, and what part of Florida, could you say what part of Florida you're in, in right now? I really don't want to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's just a, of Fort Myers. So, but, but basically it, it, all of Florida is like that from what you understand. Uh, 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 well, I would, I don't think Miami, just like another uh, urban area that's concentrated is, is like that perhaps, but um, there's definitely business as usual here in many, many ways. Interesting. Yeah, they just started opening the restaurants two days ago uh, in, in where I am, Bethesda. Bethesda, yeah. Yeah. So um, what do you think is going to happen in the future? So it sounds like what you're saying is people, you have a lot more deal flow. There is uh, capital being deployed at a discount. And, you know, what do you, what do you think is going to happen going forward? I mean, I think today I heard on the news that, that um, the recession is over. It has just... Yeah, so um, not unlike many, I love embracing fake news. Um, I'm not sure what to listen to, but yeah. when you 
you know, there's a, there's a continuum of companies, right? There's the mm -hmm. small startup, there's the round ABC, there's the large public companies, there's mm -hmm. the large private companies. And I think there's a, a variety of things you can say about all those. But for example, people are actually deploying capital in the lowest part of the capital stack uh, by buying uh, common stock shares in Hertz. Mm. Arguably was just smoked by yeah. the coronavirus. So institutional investors seem to be optimistic mm -hmm. in that things will come back. Mm -hmm. I rented a Hertz car, which is no indication for anything except you know, or you can count on Hertz, right? Yeah. Uh, but the uh, um, the private equity markets where they're non-public, uh, non-liquid, have been traditionally the uh, private equity, big private equity firms, KKR, Blackstone, BlackRock, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And family offices have traditionally stayed away from that. Mm -hmm. But many of them in the last five or six years have... Uh, started to do direct investments, not for what a lot of people believe to be disintermediation of investment banks mm -hmm. through or fees, but because they understand a certain domain expertise mm -hmm. and they deploy capital in what they understand. Mm -hmm. And your uh, made your family office fortune, let's just call it that, in a particular domain, and you see what you normally would have to pay a premium dollar for available, it not necessarily in a control, but potentially control position in a private company and something that you understand, now's the time to roll them up together, right? So mm -hmm. that's what, um, and you can get in at a discount and there's not, I'm gonna say desperate, but there's 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 a, a cash is king. So a mm -hmm. lot of people need capital. Mm -hmm. Could you, um did you talk about the, you, you mentioned the low capital st stack and you, you've kind of mentioned what it was. Could you provide a little bit more detail about what you mean by that? So I don't think it's fake news, um, but um, that I heard it on the news is that two weeks ago, Hertz, which we all know, mm -hmm. filed bankruptcy protection. Mm -hmm. So the PPP number money, whatever they got, was not nearly enough. And I have mm -hmm. no idea what the number is. Mm -hmm. But you can buy, uh, since it's a public company, a variety of of instruments to invest in Hertz. You can buy a bond. Mm -hmm. You could, uh, 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 which is essentially debt. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, try to uh, do a private investment that puts you in front of all the other creditors in some way. Or you can just buy the shares, which is the, the last person to get paid, except for the vendors, for example. It's, that's not totally true. But on the cap stack, if I just buy the common shares of Hertz, the bondholders get placed, pay, paid first, the banks get paid in some way, depending on what the covenants are. And then the, sh and then the shareholders, the common shareholders get paid before the preferred shareholders. So the point is, is that somebody who knows what they're doing, presumably, and they may not, is willing to write a check to Hertz mm -hmm. in the lowest part of the, the, the riskiest part of the capital stack because they're optimistic about Hertz coming back. Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily indicative of the rest of the market, but it's an interesting uh, flare to mm -hmm. go up. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we will get through this. People will go back to normal. And there's, there's a sentiment out there that, I don't really want to, you know, I go on the subway all the time in New York City, but, and I go on elevators all the time in New York City, but I'm not in a big hurry to do that uh, anytime soon. And the question is, is what's, what's that rubber band look like? Mm -hmm. You know, how soon will people go back to their normal habits? Mm -hmm. Many people have to do it because they have to go to work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there's many, many that can choose not to. And uh, the concert business, like, who wants to go sit next to somebody who is right. you know, high and drunk and, you know, sneezing on you? I mean, I just, uh, I'm characterizing things inappropriately, but you get my point. Yes, I get it. I get it. The same with the movies, right? Right. Um, right. Yeah. Have you seen which any- is, Which is, by the way, Rosemary, Lowe's is thinking they're not going to make it. The Lowe's theaters. Yeah. 
and the gyms, so many gyms that have uh, filed for bankruptcy. I wonder yeah. how many of those are going to make it. Yeah. Who wants to do that? Yeah. I like to work out, but I don't know about the gym. Um, yeah. So um, have you seen any changes in syndication or anything like that? Um, the syndication uh, methodology has been one that uh, is commonly used. Um, so syndication in terms of a family office taking a lead position and investing in something and rallying a bunch of their friends and taking a carried interest or management fee or not, mm -hmm. um, that is still super active. Okay, cool. I will, I, I will say that uh, syndication in terms of taking debt and consolidating it and, and spinning out a bond um, is still uh, active because you can, you can rate that bond or not rate the bond. So th there's, there's a slowing because there's still people not sure uh, what's, what's going to be happening, but there's activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you know, what time frame do you think that we will, so it sounds like everything is relatively normal. It has gotten, has, from what you have observed, it's actually just gotten a lot more deal flow. So, so the volumes are going up, the volumes of deals and the volumes of deal flow is, is going up significantly. And in my little world, the deals being done is going up, but that's just my little world. So mm -hmm. I can't, uh, uh, you know, on a grander scale with IPOs and that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I think there's a general sentiment of optimism in that this will all work itself out. Uh, yeah. But you, things aren't normal, but the, the decision and critical thinking skills are the same. Mm, Meaning when you, when you look at deploying capital, you still, you have a few more things to consider because of the pandemic and what's going on in the world otherwise. But the, 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 the critical thinking and decision metrics are the, are, are, are there's a lot of incumbent metrics that you continue to use. Um, so do you have any experience with crowdfunding platforms and, and family offices using those platforms? Um, I have experience with a couple that we know and love. I'll put a plug in for Republic. Um, and, uh, they're, uh, as many people know, they were started by the founders of AngelList and, uh, Family offices are not generally investors in uh, that stage of crowdfunding, although there are many that are, but there, for example, Republic has Republic Labs, which is the next raise. Mm -hmm. They're in that just because they don't have an allocation to uh, venture, right? Mm -hmm. They might have an allocation to venture at the round B or C or A or something like that, uh, but not at startup venture. Um, using crowdfunding uh, as a mechanism to help uh, using kick, kickstart to just put a pun there to kickstart a company that they might be funding or creating uh, is a, a very popular thing because it's essentially free money mm -hmm. meaning uh, and, and I'll get chastised for saying that uh, it's not that you don't have to consider the early shareholders. It's just that uh, the crowdfunding community are writing one hundred and a thousand dollar checks, and the uh, valuation in which they get in is is the, it, it's it's a different number. And so you can raise a million bucks or five hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a, a an idea with some sort of path to success, and so in many, many cases, it's a smart thing to do. If you're incubating a new company or you're starting a new company as a family office. And I will say this, I, that people might be interested in knowing which they might know intuitively and in what you just suggested is most of the single family offices that I know are invested in lots of interesting things that they understand. And 
they want other family offices to co-invest with them with or without friction mm -hmm. because the thing that's different about having a family office investor than an institutional investor, for example, is it comes along with not just money, which is fungible, but a whole network of people that can also invest. Mm -hmm. But even more importantly, the ability to pick up the phone and call Procter & Gamble and say, hey, can you be a customer for this company that I invested in and open that door to actually have a conversation to get a pilot done, you know, you know, mm -hmm. et, cetera, et cetera. So opening the doors and having resources other than money is a really interesting attribute of a family office investor. You know, they're not all that way, but it's, it's, uh, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, I have uh, some exciting no news on the crowdfunding platform side of things. Um, you know, the SEC has changed the regulation around uh, how much uh, non-accredited investors can invest in one company. Accredited and non-accredited investors can invest in one company um, using Title II, the CF, and now they can go goes up to $5 million. And the A-plus can go up to $50 million. So uh, during this pandemic, we launched a company called Ignite Social Impact, which is a crowd equity platform. So it'll be coming around shortly. And I was very curious about what you're going to say there. We also, by the way, launched um, just uh, an effort focused on children's health. Um, we just, the press release came out last Thursday. It's called um, Innovate Children's Health. And I know a lot of the family offices are interested in that area as well. Um, yeah, I saw that. Super excited for both things. Yeah. Um, where do you think that all the extra deal flow is coming from? Um, uh, so I can't say for sure, but my intuition tells me that a lot of people are sitting home and not in their office. And even though they're working, perhaps for somebody else, there's uh, an exponential amount of time to sit and think mm. that you're not distracted by making sure that you're making a living and satiating some other person to make sure you get paid about that for being tough on employers. Um, yeah. So, you know, imagine if you're, you have a job and you can get it done during the day while you're sitting home in your pajamas <laughs> and you've had this idea that you're going to incubate. And so it's not just startups, but people uh, are actively thinking instead of running around having, not that there's anything wrong with having a cocktail and going to dinners and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but they're actively thinking, and they may be having a cocktail at home, about, uh, okay, if I can't get together with people and my business that I have now is just not going to make it, then I need to think about new things. Mm -hmm. and then it's the same is true for the other side where people are investing and saying, all right, well, I'm glad I didn't invest in that because yeah. now it's a bad idea. Yeah. I have money to deploy and I didn't, haven't deployed money in two months. Now I'm going to start deploying it again. So um, I, I think that the uh, people aren't itching in family offices to deploy capital just to deploy capital, but they also are d uh, want opportunities that make sense. And so a lot of stuff that we've seen makes a lot of sense. I will tell you that a lot of stuff that we've seen prior made sense then makes absolutely no sense now uh -huh. uh, uh, because you just can't execute on it no one's right. going to do it and congratulations on both those efforts thank um, you thank you <laughs> if i can put a plug in on something that i invested in which is in the same uh area uh, uh not crowdfunding per se but uh democratizing investments if you don't mind yeah absolutely um, so imagine there's, a, there's a company that I invested in called skin X. Mm -hmm. Saw that. And I mentioned it to you and I of course didn't follow through, but, uh, so imagine that, um, within total, within uh, total regulatory compliance that you could invest as an investor independent of whether you're accredited investor or not in a traditional mutual fund that invests in uh, companies that aren't startups, but are 
shortly after startups and that that gives you an opportunity as a platform to have endless amounts of investors independent of whether they're accredited or otherwise or any of the regulatory constraints and that um, it just oversimplifies the uh, uh, it, it augments the ability to invest in crowdfunding and this and then uh, round A, B, and C. So it's an interesting uh, thing that people haven't uh, done, not because it couldn't be done, it just did, it didn't fit, but now it fits. So uh, if, you, if you care to, I'll, I'll share it with you later, but, and, your, and your listeners and viewers can uh, look at SkinX. We've been under the radar for a while, but we're coming out. That's all, very cool. Congratulations again on that. That's very well, interesting. Wasn't my idea. What my idea? Just helping things along. That's great. Um, so it sounds like you put your money in, and you're basically putting your money into you get a slice of a portfolio of companies that SkinX has already has put investments in. That's correct. Okay. And it also has uh, a. I don't want to disclose a bunch of it, but it's it's not just SkinX making the decision. It's part of the crowd making the decision of where they're going to deploy the capital. Aha. Uh -huh. There is a term that the gentleman on my team, Joram, uses all the time about for that. Interesting. Okay, so um, how do startups put something in front of you? Um, there's a variety of ways. They're all pretty effective. One, you can just go on the Family Office Insights website and there's an application process. Uh -huh. We get 75 to 80% of the deal flow comes from the family offices that are part of the community. They're all invested in something that they want other family offices to, oh, that's good. to, uh, to uh, see. So mm -hmm. it's pretty simple. Just go on the website. It's called Arthur's round table mm -hmm. and you, just, uh, uh, there's a, a Google standard Google intake form and we have a group that reviews them. And, uh, uh, that's, you know, that is a very simple way to do it. And then we have a bunch of really good friends out there. I don't want to call them official ambassadors, but they bring us lots of good deal flow where we don't even have to do a lot of looking under the hood because if they bring it to us, we know it's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. So we're still limited to how much we can do, but we might be expanding the ability to do more webinars, maybe two a day instead of uh, uh, one. Mm-hmm. And then what would you say for our listeners that are entrepreneurs for how they should present themselves to a family office? Do they do anything differently that if they're talking to a group of venture capitalists versus family offices? Um, most definitely, yes. Um, so, and this is not to be disparaging for venture capitalists. This is just the driver. The venture capitalists generally, and this is not with all of them, need to deploy capital and put fuel on the fire so they get two or three unicorns and gazelles or dragons to offset the 90% of uh, zeros that will happen. So they have an agenda that sooner or later they have to exit, mm -hmm. which may be fine for a business that you might be building and growing, but maybe not fine. Um, the, uh, Family offices, on the other hand, are very patient and they've gotten rich through equity or inheritance or real estate or building a business. Um, and so their liquidity needs are important, but they don't have to satisfy uh, uh, you know, 23 or 430 LPs to make sure that they put numbers up on the board and so they can raise the next fund. Nothing wrong with that, but it's it's a, a, a different mindset in that mm -hmm. it, it may not have to be an exit to, uh, to call it a success. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. So basically people, they're willing to, to, say, to sit still and um, invest for the long term if you're a family office. You're not looking not for everybody. Yeah. yeah, not everybody, but a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, patient. There's, there's, it, it tends to be more patient capital, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, when entrepreneurs are actually physically presenting, is there anything they should do like to, 
um, pull heartstrings? I mean, <laughs> what would you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's counterintuitive. Uh, I'm not a good writer, but I wrote a couple things that were edited nicely. Um, and uh, on the website, you can find how to pitch to family offices. Mm. And I coyly called it the Bavella Seven. Mm. And, uh, the one of the things that's counterintuitive, because entrepreneurs and appropriately so are salesmen. Um, they tend to leave the bad news to the end, wow. which is just a bad idea. Um, it's, it's, it's a bad idea. It's not pleasant to get dismissed at the beginning of a meeting or a mm -hmm. pitch mm -hmm. because it's, not, it's a non-starter for whatever reason. But if you disclose the bad ideas, excuse me, if you disclose the negative stuff at the beginning, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. like what the risks are, what the downsides are, you know, what the competition looks like, all the negative stuff at the beginning, after you maybe made a little bit of sizzle about what you're doing, it's, it's human nature. It's much more comforting to a family office because they don't want to get to the end of the pitch and say, had you told me that I would have left mm. at the beginning of the meeting. Cause this is just a total waste of time. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants anybody to leave. They all want to be able to convince them that to, to, to write a check, mm -hmm. but if you disclose all the negative stuff up front, then then they can decide whether they can live with it with the rest of the good stuff that you're gonna tell them. But if you do it the other way, they're unhappy and unhappy yeah. people write checks. Right. Um, <laughs> so there, there's, there's a, 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 it's a, it's a, the, 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 Seven points that I set out in that document are kind of timeless, and there many of them are just perfunctory that people understand. But we ask everybody to read it, and you know we can't tell people what to do, and nor can we make them do anything because I, it's instructive. And I'm not saying it's my brilliance; I'm just saying it's stuff that you say, "Oh yeah, you're right. I should make sure I do that. Oh yeah, 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 I should do that. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah." So it's just a reminder, <laughs> you know. Um, so everybody's welcome to do that. So, so what do you have coming up? Do you want to tell uh, the, the world about it, anything that you have coming up? Some exciting news? Um, so I have something we just did that was super interesting. So Family Office Insights and me have done a really bad job of doing all the fat, uh, what I call the soft stuff around family offices. Like uh -huh. we've just been a, a deal flow club, so to speak. Um, you know, we don't talk about your kids doing drugs and what shrink you should see and what schools you should get in and, you know, taking care of your houses all over the world. We, we don't do any of that. Um, but <laughs> just last week, uh, we had a, uh, uh, let's see if I can say this. Um, uh, three speakers, uh -huh. at least one of which is at liberty to say they're ex-CIA. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And talking about national security and not in the terms of just cybersecurity that everybody thinks about, but you know, what's going on in the world with China, Russia, Iran, mm. all this kind of stuff. And it was hugely informative. Mm. So uh, we'll be posting that uh, on the Family Office Insights YouTube channel, but it will be password protected unlike the other stuff there because the agency's not really keen on their ex officers uh, uh, not that they disclose anything they shouldn't have disclosed. It's just that we're just monitoring the whole thing. So that was super interesting. And then uh, this week we have three webinars coming up. I'm super excited about SkinX um, and what could happen there. Um, I'm about to announce something else where there's, um, we're putting liquidity in the secondary, in, liquidity in private investments mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't otherwise there. Mm. Uh, by uh, allowing for a uh, bid and ask on private investments. So for example, if you're an Airbnb employee and they're not going public anytime soon, you're sitting on a couple million dollars of equity and you can liquidate it, but there's no, the, the complications of a willing buyer and willing seller and a private transaction and all the friction associated with that is a bummer. Mm -hmm. so we're, we're working with some smart friends to, to try to provide less friction liquidity for that sort of thing. Mm. I can't wait to hear about that.
be happy to tell you about it. Yeah, well, let, let us know because we can. We'll also promote it out there. Um, yeah. Is there so? I'll just. Uh, is there anything you want to leave people with? A little bit of um, some insights about the future of family offices and how that you know. Any 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 particular valuable insights that you have? You've already provided us with lots lots of valuable insights, but. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, oftentimes, this is going to be more metaphysical, but I think okay. it has uh, uh, a merit in that with the zeal and the enthusiasm that entrepreneurs have, mm -hmm. they're usually waiting for somebody to shut up so they can say what's on their mind next. Uh -huh. So I would suggest that people as best they can have due reflection on whatever's going on and be more thoughtful about the next thing they come out of their mouth. Mm. Um, not because zeal and enthusiasm are, are bad. It's just that uh, most, if not all of the people who could potentially write checks in family offices, they're super smart. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they get off put by hubris and they get off put by uh, overzealousness. And, uh, and then the final thing is be super prepared. And that it, if somebody in the room that isn't, even though they might be experienced in your domain, isn't been sleeping, eating and drinking with your idea, sees a big hole in it that you didn't see, be ready. Mm. I mean, be ready with all the critical thinking that can be done on the idea and don't try to obfuscate things that are problematic. Mm -hmm. That's excellent advice. Excellent advice. Well, thank Arthur, thank you so much for your time today. It was, it's been incredible. I really appreciate it. I'm super, super glad to be here with you. And it's good to see you. Good I to see you gonna, too. <laughs> well, we have cocktails soon. I do too. My gosh, remember last time in New York, it was so much fun. It was. All right. Well, have a good day. Enjoy the weather. Get some vitamin D, more vitamin yeah. D. I see the palm trees behind you. They look gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right. Best Cody, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.